Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Izuku becomes the new Ghost Rider, and got harem with Momo and Shiyazaki, part 3. So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, The Smiling Mask, link is in the description. Also subscribe to our channel, and like this video. So let's begin the video. Shoda avoided a villain's outstretched arm and passing beneath him, managed to wrap his cloth around his opponent's neck. With a violent tug, the villain was knocked forward, crashing his face into the ground. Without even looking at the fallen enemy, Shoda jumped to the side to avoid a huge man with four arms who, in a few moments, found the cloth around his waist. With a huge display of strength, Shoda threw him at a small group of criminals, crushing them all with the body of their companion. Immediately after he jumped up to avoid a blade of ice, and launched himself at the enemy who had attacked him, breaking his nose with a knee. The other villains continued to throw themselves at shots to try to defeat him, but the pro hero continued to avoid their attacks, succeeding in neutralizing them with his cloth. He's good at hand to hand, and those goggles hide his eyes, so we don't know whose quirk he's cancelling. Said Kurojiri, looking at the fight, even a whole mob of us isn't slowing him down. I see Eraserhead is really dangerous, as they say. I hate pro heroes growling Tamura scratching his throat with two fingers. Ordinary villains don't stand a chance against him. Kurojiri the brats. Understood. Kurojiri nodded before vanishing into thin air, surprising Shota who had just defeated another opponent. Where did he go? Thought Shota before hearing a scream from his students who were running toward the exit with 13 dammit. In the blink of an eye that guy may be the deadliest one here. With the class, 13 had the students stop when, in front of them, the villain made of black fog appeared from the ground spreading out to the sides to block the passage. Greetings. We are the League of Villains. Said Kurojiri with a calm voice forgive our audacity. But today we've come here to the UA, this bastion of heroism, to end the life of all might, the symbol of peace. Most of the students widened their eyes in shock after hearing his words while the others looked at Kurojiri with narrowed eyes. We were under the impression that all might be here today, but it seems his schedule was revised. Well no matter the tip of a finger of 13 opened. Preparing for the impending attack my role remains unchanged. Suddenly, three figures ran towards Kurojiri, surprising him with their speed. Not if we end you first, shouted Aijiro, slashing at the black fog with his heart and arm. Behind him, Denki generated electricity in his right hand and touched the metal part on Kurojiri's neck, electrifying him instantly. The villain grunted in pain, but before he could say anything, a gloved hand approached his face and a large explosion hit him point blank. Denki, Katsuki, and Aijiro landed in front of him, ready to fight again. The redhead showed his arm while yelling Betchia didn't see that coming. For a few seconds, no one could see beyond the black smoke that had formed after the explosion. But then Kurojiri's voice was heard again, as the fog man reformed in front of them without any apparent damage. That was close. Yes students though you may be, but you're the best of the best. Sensing their opponent's move, 13 raised an arm to try, and grabbed the three students who had attacked the villain get back here. Now, my job is to scatter you all and torture you to death. Now, be gone, shouted Kurojiri and before the students could react, the villain generated an enormous amount of black fog from his body, surrounding the whole group. Surprised by the powerful gust of wind generated by his power, most of the students couldn't defend themselves, but Tenya managed to grab Ochako and Yuga, and then jump away before a dome of darkness surrounded the rest of their classmates. Looking back, Tenya's eyes widened in horror everyone. That was a really good jump. Ida breathed a male voice behind him, and the bespectacled boy was surprised to see a terrified Minoru attached to his back thanks to a sticky ball. Turning again his gaze to the dome, Tenya, and the others saw the fog spread and, much to their horror, they could see that only a few of their classmates remained. Thirteen, who had used their quirk to suck the fog around them, and Mizo, who had used his body to protect Mina and Toru. Slowly, Kurojiri reformed a few meters away from them. It seems I miss someone. Well it does not matter. None of you will go beyond this point. What do we do now? Asked Minoru looking at the villain with scared eyes. Everyone stay calm. Said 13 narrowing their eyes. I'll take care of him. You need to escape. And warn the principal. What about the others? Shouted Tenya looking around. We don't know where they are. They've been scattered. But they're all in the facility. Said Mizo. Whose deeply arms had turned into ears. And eyes to look for their classmates. Mina looked back at Kurojiri. Physical attacks are no good. He just warps away. This guy's quirk is too tough to handle. Class Vice President said 13 catching Tenya's attention. Yes, you need to go. The alarms haven't sounded, and the phones are not working. Someone is interfering with the system, and whoever is has hidden themselves well. That being the case, our best option is for you to go back and report what's happening here, explained 13 still looking at Kurojiri who was waiting for them. I can't abandon my class with Dash. Just go, Ida, shouted Mina, cutting him off. With your speed he won't catch you. There must be some alarms outside. 
If you can get out, he won't be able to follow you, added Mizo stepping forward. We will support you in the most elegant way, said Yuga with a wink. Just like in the cafeteria, nodded Achiko looking at him with firm eyes. We can, and we will provide all the support you need. Tenya clenched his fists, not knowing what to do. He couldn't abandon his classmates, but at the same time he could not stay there without doing anything. Ida, the voice of Thirteen shook him out of his internal conflict. Please, your quirk, save us all. Do it. Aside from the fact that you have no hope, Kyojiri said, advancing toward them. What sort of fool discusses strategy in front of the enemy? It hardly matters if you overheard, said Thirteen opening again the tip of their fingers starting to suck Kurojiri with their quirk you can't stop us. You say so, but Kurojiri is not at all worried by his opponent's quirk. Before Thirteen could understand Kurojiri's intentions, a black portal opened in front of them, and another behind them. The students could only watch in horror, as Thirteen was torn to pieces by their own quirk destroying their back and the back of their helmet, revealing a seemingly empty suit. 13. Looks like a disaster relief hero can't measure up to even the most ordinary of heroes when it comes to a fight, said Kurojiri looking at his opponent, and now you find yourself ripped apart by your own power. He warped me. I'm done for thought 13 before collapsing on the ground. Ida, go, shouted Mina rushing to the side of 13. Tenya looked at them again for a second before running at full speed to the exit while cursing his choice. Kurojiri looked back at Tenya, ignoring the others. My dear merely need to wait for All Might to appear. And in the blink of an eye, he was in front of the bespectacled boy. It would hardly be to our benefit if you called for your teachers. They're counting on me, thought Tenya looking at the black mist I can stop here. Suddenly, Mizo threw himself on the mist, blocking it with his body, and then Tenya continued to run. But Kurojiri was again in front of him, only this time he moved aside to avoid a ray of energy shot by Yuga. Ignoring the explosion behind him, the villain just turned to see Achiko running toward him, and it was clear that the girl was aiming at the metal plates on his neck. Clever, but it won't work, said Kurojiri prepared his quirk to teleport Achiko away, but at the last second, Tenya jumped in the air and, after grabbing his classmate, used a burst of his quirk to avoid the mist, landing near Mizo and the others. That's no good. We are at the starting point shouted Minoru crying like a baby. How can we go through him? We don't have to, said Tenya, surprising them with his calm voice. We have already done it. Kurojiri narrowed his eyes on him, but then, much to his surprise, he saw a pair of boots and gloves on the ground behind Mina. Looking back, he saw that the front door had been damaged by an explosion and was open. I see that blonde boy destroyed the door when I avoided his beam, and the invisible girl took the opportunity to escape. Said Kurojiri looked at the students who were now ready to fight him. If that girl warns the other teachers, it will be game over. I have to report what happened. And with that, he vanished into thin air. Where did he go? Asked Minoru looking around. When he realized that Hagakure had managed to escape, he decided it was better to change tactics. He probably went to warn the other villains. Said Mizo before looking at Tenya Ida. You should follow Hagakure. She's not fast like you. And we need the other heroes to be warned quickly. The bespectacled boy was about to retaliate, but now the situation was different, and since Kurojiri had gone away, his classmates could go to help others. With a nod, Tenya turned, and ran out to go back to school, and warn everyone else. What do we do now? Asked Achiko looking at the others. Why are you even asking? We're going too. It's too dangerous here, shouted Minoru, earning an annoyed look from Achiko. Guys, the scared voice of Mina caught their attention, and Ochako, Minoru, Mizo, and Yuga could very well see the fear in her eyes along with the tears. 13 Sensei he's not breathing. USJ, flood zone slash shortly before, after Kurojiri's attack, found himself in midair before falling onto the deck of a boat in the middle of what looked like a lake. Looking around, he saw bubbles coming out of the water then followed by several villains in the form of fishes, divers, and so on, all their eyes focused on him. Oh come on, there's only one brat, growled the shark man showing his shark teeth. What a waste of time, kill him. We need to hunt the others after this one, shouted another villain, ignored them completely, and walked towards the ladder at the bottom of the boat while thinking they sent me here because they think I have the quirk of that bastard of my father? A big mistake on their part. Seeing him plunge his right hand into the water, all the villains swiftly swam to shoot to kill him, believing he was openly inviting them to attack him, and indeed they were right. Only that being attacked by all of them together was just what Shoto was hoping for. In just a second, all the water around the boat froze blocking all the villains before they could hit him and while many of them were still underwater, completely frozen, those close to the surface still had their heads out of the ice. Divide and conquer eh? Said Shota looking at the frozen villains who were glaring at him. Forgive me for saying so, but it's hard to see you guys as any more than thugs with quirks you can't even handle. How can he be so strong? Is he really a kid? 
hissed the villain wincing in pain due to the ice. Shoto started walking on the ice, stopping in front of one of the villains who could still speak. At this rate, your skin will rot away from frostbite, but I'm trying to become a hero, and heroes don't do such horrible things. Leaning forward, he glared at the villain. What makes you think that you can kill All Might? Tell me the plan. USJ. Conflagration zone slash after Kirojiri's attack. Watch out, shouted Aijiro, and Denki ducked under the sword used by a villain before hitting him with his electricity. Damn, who the hell are these guys? Asked the blonde leaning against Aijiro who blocked a fist from another villain before smashing him in the face, knocking him out for good. Who the fuck cares? Yelled Katsuki raising two villains in his hands, both with bad burns on their faces they are just a bunch of fucking flies ready to be blown away. I have the impression that he didn't understand the gravity of the situation, said Aijiro with a sweat drop. Who cares? There are more of them, shouted Denki dodging another hit with Aijiro. But then that villain was smashed against the wall with an explosion. Out of my way, growled Katsuki rushing toward another villain. Well I can't let him do all the work. I wouldn't be a real man otherwise, said Aijiro, hardening his arms. Let's go, Kaminari. Eh? Wa well, wait. Oh damn it. Not wanting to stay behind, Denki surrounded himself with electricity before jumping toward a new group of villains. USJ. Landslide zone slash after Kurojiri's attack. It seems we were separated from the others said Fumikage, looking at the various villains around him. Ah looks like you're on your own brat, chuckled the villain in front of him apparently ours will be an easy job, you think so? Asked Fumikage without missing a beat. So why don't you finish your job since it is so easy? The villains narrowed their eyes, and three of them, behind Fumikage, jumped at him for the kill but, at the last moment, out of his body came a shadowy figure that struck all three villains, crashing them to the ground. The other villains took a step back when the bird-like creature turned toward them, showing its claws. Sorry to disappoint you, said Fumikage looking at the same villain, but I'm never on my own. Isn't it Dark Shadow? Creep. USJ. Downpour zone slash after Kurojiri's attack. Ribbit. I would have preferred the flood zone, but even this one shouldn't cause me any problems, said Tsuyu ignoring the rain and the wind. Koda. The boy looked at Momo who was pointing an arm at him as the villains around them were getting closer and closer. A long steel stick and a large shield emerged from her arm, and Momo handed him the shield. I know you're not a fighter so please, watch our backs, okay? Me and Azri will protect you. Koji nodded hesitantly and took the shield, placing it on his left arm as the villains laughed at them. Ah, she thinks that a shield will help them. Time to teach you a real lest you H. The villain was abruptly interrupted by Tsuyu's tongue, which twisted around his throat before dragging him to the trio where Momo hit him in the face with her steel staff, causing him to lose consciousness. As the class president, it is my duty to protect my classmates, said Momo spinning the steel staff in her hands. I will not let you hurt them, Ribbit. I guess Midoriya and Todoroki made the right choice when they voted for you, mumbled Tsuyu standing on Momo's right while Koji was behind them, a timid smile on his face, as he was nodding. Thank you, Ajui. But it's too early to say that. First, we need to win here, said Momo with a smile on her face, preparing herself for the imminent clash with the villains. USJ. Ruined zone slash after Kirojiri's attack. Oi Sato, how much sugar do you have with you? Asked Hanta with his back against one of his friends, as they were surrounded by dozens of villains inside a ruined building. Just enough to make our way to the exit at least that's what I hope, replied Rikido with his fists raised to fight. Hanta couldn't help, but sweat. You are not very reassuring you know? Take this, shouted a villain trying to hit Hanta with his claws, but the black-haired boy managed to dodge the attack before using his quirk to immobilize the enemy. When an idea flashed through his mind Sato, how good are you at throwing weights? Looking at his classmate, Rikido saw the villain wrapped in tape with Hanta handing him the end of said tape. With a smirk on his lips, he ate some sugar cubes, and became much more muscular before grabbing the tape with both hands. I don't know, but I can always try and with his strength threw the enemy at the others, thus defeating at least half a dozen of villains. Alright, let's clean up, and then let's get out of here, shouted Hanta shooting his tape at their enemies with Rikudo right behind him. USJ, mountain zone slash after Kurojiri's attack. Stand still, you bastard, shouted a villain trying to stab Mashireo before being hit by his tail. Jiro, I'm ready. The purple-haired girl looked turned in his direction just when he jumped away and all the villains in front of her were struck by a powerful sound attack that forced them to cover their ears to avoid becoming deaf. However, when the attack ended, they couldn't recover in time before being hit by Mashireo's tail, which crushed them to the ground without any difficulty. I got you, screamed another villain behind Kyoka trying to stab her with two knives but spinning on her heels she hit him with her earlobes using them like whips, sending him against two of his comrades. Mashireo landed behind her. Looking at the other enemies I counted at least 30 still standing. 15 for each of us. We can do it, said Kyoka. But before she could attack another villain, 
The whole USJ shook for a few seconds, followed by a sudden heat wave, alarming everyone inside. An explosion? Asked Mashireo looking around before seeing the shocked face of his classmate. What's wrong? Something happened in the sandstorm zone. It was Midoriya, USJ. Sandstorm zone slash after Kurojiri's attack. Flames and sand danced in the wind, as the only two fighters left in the area continued to fight ferociously, trying to end the battle. Even though their fight had been going on for several minutes, either Izuku nor Flint showed signs of weariness. Steaming craters surrounded them, obvious signs of Izuku's powers, and what remained of the other villains who had found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. Although he focused exclusively on the enemy with the sand-based quirk, Izuka hadn't spared the other villains, killing them one by one before they could escape from his flames. Meanwhile, Flint had tried several times to stop the flaming skeleton but, as far as his destructive power was concerned, the Sandman was clearly at a disadvantage, and the only reason he had managed to survive for so long was the huge desert area in which they were fighting. With a demonic roar, Izuka flung his chain to hit Flint, managing to wrap it around his right arm but, almost instantly, the whole arm became simple sand, knocking down the chain and the sickle. Izuku growled in exasperation. Since they had started fighting, he hadn't yet managed to hurt his opponent permanently. The mere brute force had been useless, as Flint could become sand at will. So Izuku had tried with his flames, but the entire desert around them had become a sort of shield for Flint who had used it to defend himself. Dissolving himself in the sand around him, Flint vanished from the sight of Izuku only to reappear behind him with his right arm much bigger than before. When Izuku noticed his presence, he turned to protect himself, but the huge fist, now hard as steel, impacted his skull, cracking it in several places. The power behind the fist threw Izuku several meters away, making him bounce off the sand dunes. When he managed to stop, Izuku immediately turned to his opponent, as the cracks on his skull healed quickly, but Flint had vanished again. At that moment, a tentacle of sand twisted around his ankle before lifting him up into the air. Looking down, Izuku saw that it was Flint's right arm, but before he could destroy it, his opponent turned his left hand into a huge, smooth block of compressed sand. Without giving the flaming skeleton time to react, Flint crashed him into the sand, cracking both Izuku's bones and the block of sand, then compressing his body using his right hand after turning it into a block similar to the other. At the moment of impact, Flint heard the sound of Izuku's bones as they broke under the pressure of his sand but through the thin slit that divided the two blocks, he saw a light grow brighter and brighter. Widening his in surprise, Flint turned again into sand before a violent explosion broke out between the two blocks, destroying everything within a radius of dozens of meters, and shaking the entire structure for a few seconds. Reforming slowly at a safe distance, Flint saw the consequences of that explosion, which was a huge crater in the center of which was Izuka with the costume ruined in several places. The boy was several meters below him, and under his feet there was reinforced concrete, a sign that he had reached the bottom of that area. Looking around, Flint noticed that in many places the sand had been turned into glass, and some pieces of glass were about to melt. The heat produced by his flames has increased exponentially even if only for a few moments. At least 2000 degrees Celsius if he managed to turn my sand into glass, and melt it. Thought Flint looking back at Izuku who was now glaring at him could it be that he cannot maintain certain temperatures without destroying himself? Or maybe he did it so as not to put the other students at risk? A temperature too high could have serious consequences on those who cannot sustain them. Still clutching the chain in his hands, Izuku tried to hit his enemy after inflaming it. But this time Flint put both his hands in the sand below him and created a sand wall in front of him with which he blocked the chain. Before Izuku could recover his weapon, Flint changed the sand wall into his arms and broke the chain with a violent tug, throwing the end with the sickle on the ground, then letting the rest go. Izuka looked at his weapon now destroyed, and with a deep growl, he threw it to the ground, before looking back at his opponent. Without wasting time, Izuka jumped toward Flint creating two balls of fire that he threw with precision, but instead of aiming directly at Flint, he aimed at the sand beneath him. His opponent seemed to guess his intentions and immediately created a sand wall in front of him to protect himself. The balls of fire hit the wall without being able to destroy it, but Izuku did not even notice, and when he landed in front of the wall, he put his hands on it. On the other side, Flint barely managed to notice the temperature increase and dissolved into the sand below before a huge cone of flames could hit him. The flames devoured the sand in front of Izuku, turning it into glass or melted sand, surprising Flint who had just reformed several meters away. He was not aiming at me, but at the sand. He must have understood that the less sand there is, the less strong I am. Thought Flint with narrowed eyes I must end this fight quickly. Sensing Flint's presence on his right, Izuka turned to face him, but a huge sand blast hit him in the face, sending him into the air. 
Before he could react, Flint started to hit him with a long series of attacks from different directions without letting him fall to the ground. After he managed to launch Izuku upward with his face turned towards the ceiling, Flint stopped him before piercing his chest with several blades of compressed sand, breaking his ribcage. However, he immediately saw that the sand in Izuku's body had already been destroyed by the flames, so he decided to move on to something more drastic. Destroying a sand tentacle with an explosion of flames, Izuku found himself with his chest wrapped in the sand, and a moment later, the sand began to pull, in two different directions. In spite of the complete absence of flesh on his bones, a grisly sound echoed in the air when Flint broke Izuku in half, throwing his waist and legs to the ground, but holding his upper body in midair using his right arm. Without wasting any further time, Flint used his left hand to grab Izuku's skull, and began to squeeze it while trying to tear it away from the rest of his body. However, this prevented him from noticing that under them the ground was starting to overheat more, and more thanks to Izuku's powers, until the flaming skeleton managed to generate violent flames that surrounded them in an instant. Flint stared down for a moment, then looked back at Izuku, and though he no longer had eyes, Flint was sure his opponent was staring at him. Before he could defend himself, a huge column of flames rose upward, engulfing the two fighters. The flames were dispersed within a few seconds, but in the end what remained was a perfectly regenerated Izuku with his skull still tight in Flint's hand, who was now completely turned into glass. Without even trying, Izuku shattered Flint's hand and turned to leave, but after a single step, his gaze landed on the ground below him, where he saw fragments of glass moving to a point behind him. As soon as he saw those fragments, a glass blade pierced his chest from behind, lifting him slightly off the ground. Turning his head slightly, Izuku saw that Flint had not been defeated, and indeed he was still fighting even though he had become glass, but most of his body was slowly coming back to be sand. With a slight growl, his flames melted the blade of glass, and Izuku turned again to face his opponent, hitting him instantly with a violent blaze before Flint could turn entirely into sand. His flames, however, didn't diminish in power, and continued to burn Flint until he was completely dissolved, leaving only a steaming puddle on the vitrified soil. Izuku stared for a few seconds at the puddle, ignoring the sand around him that was moving in a certain direction. You can create all the clones you want, but I know you're still here. An imposing shadow obscured Izuku and the surrounding ground, as a slight tremor shook the entire structure. Slowly, Izuku turned to look at a huge humanoid made entirely of sand, and as tall as an eight-story building. Despite the absence of color and facial details, Izuku knew full well that the giant was Flint. The Sandman looked down at his opponent, raising his right arm. Izuku stood on the spot waiting for the blow and, when the huge hand hit the sandy ground, a violent shock wave threw tons of sand into the air, creating huge cracks in the domed ceiling. Instead of raising his arm, Flint applied even more pressure to completely crush Izuku, turning his other hand into a giant hammer. I have to try and lock him under as much sand as possible. If he tries to use his flames he will remain stuck in the glass, be it solid or liquefied. Thought Flint was raising the hammer, but before he could hit the spot where Izuku was buried, a column of fire, much larger than the previous one, burned his right hand and part of the arm, forcing Flint to take a few steps back. So much power, how can he be so strong? His flames are perhaps even more powerful than those of Endeavor and the Human Torch. So focused on the flames of his opponent, Flint did not notice the imminent attack until it was too late, and a huge fist wrapped in flames hit him in the face, destroying the whole head. Staggering backwards, it took him a few seconds to recreate his head, and when he looked at his opponent, Flint could not help but widen his eyes in shock because there, in front of him, there was an Izuku, as tall as him, if not even more. Impossible, I thought his quirk was something connected to the flames. Don't tell me that he also has a gigantification quirk. With a powerful roar, Izuku took a step forward, shaking the entire area before throwing a ball of fire at Flint, hitting him in the chest. The Sand Colossus seemed to ignore the attack and, recreating his right arm, turned it into a hammer like his left hand. Using all his strength, Flint tried to hit Izuku with both hammers to crush his skull, but Izuku raised his arms using his forearms to defend himself, and the impact generated two powerful shock waves that made the area tremble even more, causing many debris to fall from the ceiling. With his arms busy, Izuku tilted his head back before throwing up a huge amount of flames on his opponent. The heat combined with the power of the attack greatly weakened Flint, who was now reaching his limit, and the sand present around the two giants was being consumed in large quantities by both the flames of Izuku and the quirk of Flint, who was using it to regenerate his body. Feeling the weakening of his opponent, Izuku used his strength to wipe away Flint's arms while creating a ball of fire in his right hand. The Sandman then tried to concentrate most of the sand to recreate his left arm and defend himself, but Izuku also disintegrated that last defense to thrust the ball of fire into the body of the Sand Colossus. In a violent explosion of flames, 
the entire sandstorm zone was virtually destroyed, causing the ceiling to collapse and damaging the entire USJ, which shook for several seconds. At the end of the explosion and subsequent devastation, Izuku was enveloped by his flames before returning to his original height. Looking around, the flaming skeleton seemed to concentrate on a large pile of debris that was thrown away in a few seconds. Looking down, he saw the defeated form of Flint, whose body was only partly still whole, since his legs and right arm were missing, but there was no sign of regeneration for the time being. The man stared at his opponent with heavy breathing, barely opening his eyes due to the light produced by the flames, but this did not prevent him from seeing Izuku for what he seemed. A demon, with no energy left to fight, Flint closed his eyes as he saw Izuku raise his right arm, preparing for his imminent end. But no attack came, and a whistle was heard in the air. Confused by that sound, he opened his eyes again only to see Izuku with two fingers between his teeth, as if he had just whistled. In a few seconds, a roar was heard in the distance, and shortly after a flaming motorcycle came to the back of Izuku, stopping a few inches from him. Without waiting a second, Izuku turned to his vehicle and climbed into the saddle, but Flint's voice prevented him from leaving immediately. Why? asked the man, raising his head. Why not kill me? You, Izuka said before turning around to watch him one last time innocent. Surprised by his words, Flint could only look at Izuka with confusion, as he drove his bike to the edge of the sandstorm zone, soon fading from his sight. Feeling the weariness grow ever more oppressive, Flint rested his head on the ground, closing his eyes slowly. Am I innocent? Soon after, unconsciousness prevailed over him. USJ, downpour zone slash after Kuro Jiri's attack. Momo couldn't help but curse when a villain managed to open a cut on her arm with a dagger, making her bleed profusely. A new wound that was added to the list of wounds received since she found herself in that hell with her classmates. Behind her, Koji was barely conscious on the ground with a nasty wound on his belly and his blood-stained hands trying to stop the bleeding, while Tsuyu was at his side to protect him in case some villain managed to get past Momo, the only one to keep them at bay at the exit of the alley where they had taken refuge. In the last few minutes the situation had degenerated to extreme levels. After a first moment of apparent victory, the villains had exploited Koji's situation to attack him. Neither the seismic shocks that had shaken the area nor the sudden heat wave had served to make them run away, and when one of those villains had managed to stab Koji, the situation had worsened further. I don't know how long I can go on with this. I'm running out of energy, and there are still at least 20 enemies. Thought Momo was hitting a villain in the face with her staff, but at that moment another criminal succeeded in grasping her staff before kicking Momo away, causing her to fall to the ground. Time for some payback, bitch. Said the villain with a huge grin will have some fun with you and that frog girl before killing you. The villains behind him rejoiced at his words, but soon the screams of many of them turned into shouts of terror and fear. The villain who had struck Momo up turned to see what was happening, and the last thing he saw was a dart of flames flying towards his face. Momo, see you, and a very pale Koji could only watch in silence, as all the villains were reduced to heaps of ashes by fire attacks and seconds later, a motorbike wrapped in flames passed in front of the alley without stopping, heading towards the center of the USJ. Ribbit. That bike whispered to Tsuyu looking at Momo. Was it Midoriya? I think so, said Momo looking at the piles of ash as they were washed away by rain and wind before focusing on another problem. No time for that. Koda is still injured. I will create gauze and painkillers. Ajri help me. While creating the necessary medications, Momo couldn't help, but look back at where she had seen the motorcycle pass. Was it really Midoriya? He killed them so easily without hesitation a shiver ran through her back making her tremble, and the young girl couldn't tell if the cause was the rain, the wind or something else. USJ, Central Plaza slash Meanwhile. Fear and horror were the only things Shoto could think of, as a chilling sound of broken bones was heard in the air. In front of him, a few meters away, his teacher was crushed to the ground with both arms broken in several places. The huge Nomu with the bird's beak made a sharp and inhuman sound while behind him Tamira watched everything with a hidden grin. Meet the anti-symbol of peace, the bioengineered Nomu. He snapped my arms like twigs, looking at any part of his body should be enough to nullify him. Thought Shota gritting his teeth in pain that means this is base strength. He's easily as strong as all might. Cancelling out quirks is pretty cool, but nothing special. Said Tamira walking toward Shota against something like Nomu. You might, as well be quirkless. I have to think about something. But I'm pretty sure thought Shota looking at the second Nomu behind Tamira that the other one will do something. As soon as I tried to intervene, and just when he was about to attack with an area attack, Kurojiri reappeared behind Tamira. Kurojiri, is 13 dead? He's incapacitated, maybe dead, but there were some students I couldn't warp away. One of them escaped. Oh? Tamira looked back at him scratching his neck Kurojiri. I'd turn you to dust if you weren't our ticket out of here. We don't stand a chance against dozens of pros. It's game over man. Game over for now. Looking away he added we're leaving. They are leaving? 
thought Shota with a raised eyebrow they did all this mess to kill All Might, and then they leave just like that. What's wrong with these guys? But before that said Tamura catching his attention, which soon turned into anxiety when Tamura looked right at him let's leave at least one dead kid in a burst of incredible speed. He was in front of the boy with his right hand a few inches from the face of Shu to wound the pride of the symbol of peace. Wa dash. Shota couldn't say anything that Tamura's fingers touched his face, but strangely nothing happened. After a few seconds of silence, the villain slowly turned to Shoto, noting his bright red eyes. You really are a pretty cool erased head. The Nomu who kept Shota firmly crushed his head in the ground, but those few moments of distraction were all that you needed to create several spikes of ice in front of him. However Tamura avoided them all with a leap backward. Trying to hit him again, the son of Endeavor created more ice, but with a simple call from Tamura, the Noma with the beak stood before him, and with one fist destroyed all the ice coming, shocking the Shoto. A single punch was enough for him? Not even that bastard of my father would be able to do something like that. How strong is that creature? Thought Shoto was preparing himself for another attack. But then, the sound of an engine was heard in the air, and from some not-so-distant trees a motorcycle flew into the air with a skeleton dressed in black riding it. Izuka landed not far from the group, and everyone turned to him without reacting immediately upon his arrival. Flaming Sentua said Tamura if you're here it means that pile of sand has failed. Figured if I could trust an American with such a task, I guess we'll have to take care of you. Without giving him the opportunity to speak further, Izuka accelerated towards Tamura to hit him, but the second Nomu intercepted him in a few moments, lifting the bike, and hurling it in the distance with Izuku. Without waiting any longer, the eyeless Nomu took a huge leap to follow Izuku, as Tamura returned to look at Shoto. Now should we resume our dash? Boom! A deafening noise echoed in the USJ, as what remained of two steel gates crashed in the center of the plaza, risking to crush some villains. Everyone turned towards the entrance where a large cloud of dust and smoke had been generated, and in the silence that followed that violent noise, the sound of footsteps echoed in the air, as a figure began to emerge from the smoke. I had a bad feeling, so I tore myself away from my chat with the principal, and came here. Mina, Achiko, and Minoru could only cry tears of joy at hearing his words, while Yuga and Misa looked in awe at his imposing figure. I passed young Ida and young Hagakure on my way, and got a rough idea of what had happened. Grinding his teeth, his figure soon became visible to all the remaining villains who could only watch him while intimidated by his aura of power. Good grief. It really makes me angry. Thinking about how frightening it must have been for the children, and how hard my juniors fought, but that's why I must proudly say, slamming a foot on the ground thus creating cracks in the floor, he tore off his tie with brute force. It's fine now, I am here. All might, cried Achiko wiping away her tears while the villain stepped back from him. It's really him. It's my first time seeing him in person. He looks so intimidating. A all might the desperate voice of Mina caught his attention. But then, he saw the unmoving form of 13T13 Sensei he he. Widening his eyes, All Might quickly approached the hero on the ground, looking in horror at the wounds they had suffered. Thirteen was not like most people, as they didn't have a real body, and their suit had been specially designed to allow them to move freely, but now that the suit had been almost completely destroyed. Thirteen. Slowly, All Might placed a hand near the base of their helmet to feel the equivalent of a heartbeat that, in the case of Thirteen, was equivalent to a kind of faint vibration that could be felt by touching his suit. Upon touching the suit, all Might felt nothing. What lay in front of him was only an empty suit. Thirteen, the space hero, was dead. A dark silence fell on the small group, as All Might kept staring at Thirteen's suit, his face shadowed by the overhead lights. All Might? Whispered Mina feeling suddenly frightened by the presence of the hero in front of her. Everyone. His voice made them shiver instantly, and both Minoru and Yuga stepped back unconsciously. Stay here. And with those words, he vanished into thin air, surprising the students. A moment later, screams of pain rose in the air and they barely had time to look in the plaza, where All Might had already wiped out most of the villains, who fell to the ground with broken limbs. He gently took Shota in his arms sorry Aizawa. I was too late. Turning to Tamura, and the others, a sudden blue glow lit up in his eyes, and a moment later, Shoto found himself at his side with the unconscious eraser head, as the hand on Tamura's face fell to the ground, as if it had been hit by someone. Young Todoroki Dot said All Might caught the attention of the student. Go to the entrance. I'm leaving Aizawa to you. He's unconscious. Hurry. Looked at him with a worried expression. All Might. That villain with the beak he destroyed my ice with just one punch. He is probably as strong as you. Young Todoroki. All Might didn't look back, preferring to keep his eyes on Tamura Go. Settling Shota over his shoulders, the student nodded to the hero and ran off to the entrance leaving All Might alone. Meanwhile, Tamura had bowed to pick up the hand that covered his face, 
placing it slowly where it was before. Throwing punches to save people, ah, that's our state-sponsored violence, said Tamira slowly turning toward All Might with a sick grin, you're fast. Too fast to keep up with, but not as fast as expected. Could it really be true that you are Dash? The words died in his throat, and his grin vanished from his face. As soon as he saw the expression of All Might, who was still glaring at him. What is this? thought Kurojiri looking at the hero with a shiver running down his back. For that mission, they had prepared themselves to the best of their abilities to face All Might, learning all that was possible about him. And one of the things that everyone knew in the world was that he always smiled. Except at that moment. His face was a mask of fury and rage, and the black scara of his eyes did nothing but make him even more menacing. A violent column of flames rose to the sky behind them, and Kurojiri did not even have to turn around to understand that it was Izuku dealing with the other Nomu. We managed to get rid of Flaming Centaur for the moment, and now All Might is here. Looking once more at the hero's face, Kurojiri couldn't help but whisper a few simple words. We traded one demon for another. Before crashing to the ground, after being thrown into the air by the Nomu, Izuka managed to turn the motorcycle in midair so as to land on the wheels. The impact generated a violent shockwave, and the ground below cracked heavily, but he didn't even seem to notice it. Raising his head slightly, Izuka saw the Noma who had thrown him away from the central plaza land a few meters away, generating an equally violent shockwave. Nomu immediately turned to Izuku, and lunged at him to try to hit him with a fist, but Izuka tilted his head to the side thus avoiding the blow, before hitting his opponent with a violent uppercut to the chin. A chilling noise of broken bones rose in the air when Nomu's head ended with the chin pointing to the sky, its neck now broken. However, in a matter of seconds, the Nomu returned to look at Izuku, as if it had never been hit, and instead tried to crush Izuku with both hands closed like a mallet. Izuku crossed his arms over the head to protect himself, and when the Nomu hit his arms, a violent shock wave uprooted some of the nearby trees from the ground while Izuku and his bike created a small crater below them, with the bike that seemed to growl through the engine due to the pressure. Suddenly stretching out his arms, Izuku managed to repel the enemy, making it step back before hitting the creature in the chest with a ball of fire. The explosion that followed through the Nomu several meters away while Izuku dismounted from the bike, and approached his enemy which was already getting up, albeit with a nasty burn on its chest. With an inhuman roar, Nomu tried to hit Izuku again with a fist, but he simply raised his hand, and caught the fist. Some of his bones cracked due to the impact, but Izuka simply tightened his grip on the fist, and Nomu tried in vain to free itself, continuing to pull with its arm. Meanwhile, Izuka silently watched the creature in front of him, almost interested in what he was sensing, that is, nothing. That humanoid thing was almost devoid of soul, an empty shell. He could feel remnants of its soul, and sins, but they were very feeble, as if the mind, and soul of that thing, before becoming such, had been distorted, and destroyed by an external force. The Noma managed to free itself at that moment by sacrificing part of its arm that remained in the hand of Izuku, not at all disturbed from what had just happened, as the arm of the creature would grow back in a few moments. Like a mindless beast, Nomu tried again to hit the flaming skeleton with a fist, but this time Izuku grabbed its arm before throwing his opponent to the ground. The creature didn't have time to get up again so Izuku put a foot on its chest, as he held his right hand pointed straight up. Without hesitation, he punched the head of the Noma with a fist wrapped in flames, and in a few moments a huge column of fire was generated around them, slowly consuming the monster who howled in pain, trying to escape. But Izuku didn't let it go, and in a few seconds, the Noma's howls of pain ceased, as its body was slowly turned into ashes. A few seconds later, with only one movement of the arm, the flames dissipated, and the remains of the Noma crumbled on themselves while Izuku had already turned to return to his motorcycle when a small seismic shock caught his attention, and, not far away, he saw some trees thrown into the air. Slightly lowering his gaze, Izuku saw a large cloud of dust grow with the passing of seconds, and whatever had raised it, it was coming towards him. USJ, Central Plaza slash shortly before. Noma! Tamura's cry was all that the Noma with the beak needed to shoot forward and intercept the All Might Fist, which had immediately aimed at the young boy. The pro hero, however, struck Nomu in the chest, but the creature didn't seem to suffer any damage, and tried to grab All Might by the arms, but he jumped back. No damage at all, thought All Might with narrowed eyes before looking for a moment at Tamura if I want to reach him, I need to deal with this thing first. And without hesitating, he tried to defeat the Noma with a quick series of punches to the head, but none of them seemed to have an effect on the creature. Seeing that All Might wasn't able to defeat Nomu, Tamira seemed to regain confidence in his plan. You scared me before, I thought you would have defeated my special bioengineered weapon in an instant, but instead you aren't able to, and you know why? He took a step forward with a hidden grin on his face because it's got shock absorption. If you really want to damage Nomu, you'd be better off slowly ripping him apart, piece by piece, 
Not that it'll give you that chance. Shock absorption, huh? In that case, All Might avoided a punch in the face before going around his opponent and encircling its waist with his arms. Without giving it time to react, All Might arched his body and tried to crash the Nomu to the ground with a powerful suplex that generated a violent shockwave. However, when the dust dispersed, the few students present were shocked to see that a portal of dark fog had blocked All Might's attack, making the upper part of its body appear right under the pro hero and, at that moment, the Nomu had its claws stuck in All Might's sides, making him bleed. So you hope to drive him into the concrete and seal his movements? Asked Tamira with a raised eyebrow. It wouldn't have worked dash. Crunch. Huh. Tamira could only watch with horror and fear as All Might proceeded to drag out of the portal his opponent, after having grabbed its wrists before breaking them with the sheer force of his hands. After that, All Might crashed the Nomu against the ground, creating a small crater in the concrete under them. That's impossible, thought Tamira with scared eyes he shouldn't be so strong. You said the best way to defeat your weapon would be to slowly rip it apart, piece by piece, right? Asked All Might, looking straight at Tamira. If it were not in a hurry, I might even consider your suggestion. TCH. Don't think you've won just because you broke its wrists. Nomu was created to defeat you, shouted Tamira with his voice filled with rage and, at that moment, the Nomu stood up, his wrists already regenerating. See? This is its hyper-regeneration. As I just told you, Nomu was specially created to fight and defeat you. All Might stared at the creature in front of him with a strange light in his eyes a biological weapon created to defeat me, equipped with quirks suitable for the purpose. It's not possible to obtain a similar result with simple science. This is certainly his work, but his thoughts were suddenly interrupted when three blurs darted towards Tamira and Kurojiri. Two of them, who were Denki and Aijiro respectively, tried to hit Tamira from behind, but the villain managed to avoid them both by jumping, landing at a safe distance from the two students. On the other hand, Kurojiri wasn't so lucky, and Katsuki managed to hit him with an explosion near his head succeeding then to throw him on the ground with one hand pressed against the metal parts on his neck. You slipped up, you bastard, said Katsuki with a huge grin on his face while Denki and Aijiro moved near him. As I thought, that dark fog serves to hide your physical body. Now, try doing something fishy, and I'll blow you straight to the kingdom come. That's not very hero-like you know, muttered Denki with a sweat drop. Not only have you defeated our associates, but you're all at full health, said Tamira, looking at the three students. Today's kids really are something. Our League of Villains should be ashamed. He then glanced at All Might. Hayes aiming at me, as if I were the final boss. If we don't recover Kurojiri, we won't be able to leave here. If I send Nomu to retrieve him, I won't have more defenses. But if what is said about All Might is true, noticing his gaze, All Might couldn't help but narrow his own eyes. He's plotting something. Noma. Tamira's voice was calm despite the sick grin hidden by the hand on his face. Take out the explosive brat. We need our escape route back. In a blink of an eye, the Noma sprinted toward Katsuki who couldn't even see it move, with alarming speed, but All Might managed to follow it with his eyes. Fast, Noma's first hit the mark, and a violent wave of wind swept away all the surrounding trees while its target was thrown several meters away. But Tamira had his eyes pointed in another direction. That is where Katsuki and the other two students had just landed. One of those brats has an electric quirk, but none of them have the reflexes to keep up with Noma. Which means, looking towards the direction where Nomu had struck someone, Tamira was delighted to see All Might with his arms crossed in front of his face, and a big bruise on the left forearm. Not far away, Katsuki, and the others watched in astonishment at the power shown by the creature which was fighting against the pro hero. T that thing I is dangerous, said Denki with a trembling voice. At his side Katsuki gritted his teeth staring at the villain who had almost hit him without any difficulty I couldn't see a thing. All of a sudden, a female voice was heard behind them, Kaminari, you're here too? And turning around at the same time, the three students saw Momo come out from behind some trees with an arm of Koji around her neck while Tsuyu was right behind them, and judging by Koji's face and bloody bandages, he was suffering a lot. More brats? Uh, at least one of them is injured. Maybe our associates are not that useless, said Tamira, catching their attention before returning his gaze to All Might. And it was at that moment that he noticed a detail first hidden by the dust raised by Noma's blow. A demonic motorcycle with its rider a few meters from it and his gaze was fixed on Tamira. His heart began to beat faster, as his eyes first looked at the form of Izuku, and then noticed the complete absence of the second Noma. This isn't good, All Might is still standing, and that damned flaming centaur must have killed the other Nomu. Tamira looked at his two opponents, but while Izuku was focused only on him, All Might turned his head to watch the blazing form of his student. Young Midoriya you seem to have lost control again thought All Might before moving his gaze on Nomu, and Tamira I need to end this fast before the situation gets worse. However, Tamira seemed intent on making things worse with Kurojiri, 
Noma, slow down those two while I take care of the brats. Now reinforcements will be here in moments, and will be game over. Before leaving, however, I want at least to leave some corpses at the feet of the number one hero. The three villains dashed at the same time. All Might could see from the corner of his eye that Izuku had already jumped onto his bike, probably to launch himself on the attack, while the six students targeted by Tamiro were trying to get ready to defend themselves. Everything seemed to go in slow motion, while All Might himself was preparing to face the Nomu again. But then, it's fine, Tamiro. You can stop now. Out of nowhere, a strange ink-like liquid appeared behind the three villains, starting to fill with bubbles and growing in quantity to create a sort of vertical puddle from which came that deep, metallic male voice. Someone slowly began to come out of that liquid, and in a few moments, a person dressed in dark clothes entered the central plaza. He was tall, almost as tall as All Might, and the black suit was of little use to hide his imposing figure, but what caught the eye was his black skull-like mask with angular pipes at the top, and a strange large collar around his neck. He did nothing, simply remaining motionless on the spot, but it was more than enough to unleash a wave of fear and terror that hit the whole USJ. From the bravest of the students to the most cowardly villain, all of them were frozen by fear, eyes full of terror, and mouths open in silent screams. All they could see, all they could feel, was their imminent end, a slow and brutal end, as reflected in the visions caused by that wave of pure malice and cruelty. The man just raised his head, looking at the hero not far from him. We meet again, all might, said hero narrowed his eyes so you're finally back, all for one. On the road to the USJ slash at the same time, a huge yellow and black vehicle, which could be compared to the union of a bulldozer and a monster truck, was advancing at full speed along the road to the USJ, leaving behind signs on the asphalt. This thing can't go faster? asked Midnight, looking at the back of the cockpit. It was designed to be used on rough terrain, not on a paved road, shouted back power loader while driving the vehicle if I accelerate even more, I would risk destroying the asphalt. Midnight huffed before crossing her arms to the chest, watching the other teachers currently sitting behind the cockpit inside a comfortable trailer with chairs. The only one who wasn't seated in a chair was Nizu, the principal of Yue, currently sitting on Vlad King's legs, as he listened again to Toru and Tenya, the two students who had returned to school to warn them of the villain attack. A quirk able to warp so many people, said Nizu shaking his head. It's a pity that a person with such a rare quirk has decided to become a villain. Now is not the time to think about those things. We must first of all take care of the safety of the students, said Recovery Girl with a stern face. I just hope there are no serious injuries. If I remember correctly, there is a well-equipped infirmary at the USJ. We could use that for any injured, proposed Cementas sitting in front of her. Yes, that could war dash. She stopped mid-sentence, gripping her cane tightly. Toru and Tenya, both sitting near Vlad King, noticed how the atmosphere had suddenly become darker and tense. All the teachers had their eyes wide open as if something had caught them off guard. This feeling growled at Vlad King. Yes, there's no doubt. It's him, said Niza with a nod before looking toward the cockpit power loader. We need to reach the USJ, as soon as possible. I'll deal with any complaints about the asphalt. Roger that. Hold on tight back there, shouted the driver. And a few moments later everyone felt an increase in speed. You unprincipled Niza said to Toru with a weak voice whom were you talking about? The small humanoid animal sighed I would rather not talk to you about this. But if it goes like I think, you'll soon understand. Tenya looked at his classmate with worried eyes, feeling that Toru was doing the same with him. What the hell is going on? USJ Central Plaza. Sensei? Murmured Tamura looking at the masked man with surprised eyes. What are you doing here? You can't move with that body. Don't worry Tamura. I'm not here to fight with all might but simply to take you home, said all for one with a calm voice flaming Centaur's unexpected presence is a factor that alone could ruin your plan. Good thing I sent an eye to observe the situation. As if his words had triggered something, Izuku rushed towards all for one, remaining on one wheel for a moment before gaining speed, but the villain didn't seem at all troubled by his action. Kuro Jairi, sent to him on the other side of the square, said all for one still with his calm voice. Without objecting to his orders, Kuro Jairi took a step forward and, when Izuku was a few meters away, opened a portal in front of his motorcycle. Izuku couldn't stop in time, and crossed the portal, finding himself on the other side of the square. Realizing his new position, he immediately turned the handlebars, braking at the same time so as to make his bike drift. When he finally managed to stop, Izuku looked at all for one, a threatening growl rising up his throat. So he's really a student? You should start teaching him something about prudence. All might. If your teacher could see you now, what do you think she would say? Asked all for one and a note of mockery was distinguishable in his voice. All Might clenched his fists with anger before crossing the arms in front of his chest. I don't know why you made your return today, but I don't care. If I let you escape it would be an insult to 13th's memory. Oh, so you killed 13? Asked All for One, 
with a vaguely surprised voice. Yes, I used his quirk against him. However, I didn't stay to make sure of his death. Explained Kurojiri with a nod. It's a pity. His quirk was rather special, but his strength was the result of a lot of training and a lot of experience in using it. Said all for one, his quirk would not have served my purpose. Carolina, all my dashed forward to hit all for one, destroying the floor behind him. But when he was about to hit his opponent, the masked villain raised his hand and his fingers turned into strange little black tendrils that immediately wrapped around the chest of All Might, preventing him from ending his attack, before throwing him onto Izuku who had again tried to reach them with his motorbike. The impact knocked Izuku away from his bike with All Might ending up on top of him, but before the hero could move, Izuku abruptly pushed him away with his arm before getting up again. With a demonic snarl, he created flames around his arms which then turned into metal chains wrapped in fire. Much to All Might's surprise, and with a wide movement of his arms, he whipped the air aiming at All for One with the chains that stretched out of all proportion, but his enemy raised a hand once again. An interesting trick, but let me show you mine now. And with that, he snapped his fingers. For an instant nothing happened, but then the area in front of him was hit by a violent wave of air that broke the chains to pieces leaving deep gashes in the ground before reaching Izuku, shredding his costume, as well as his bones, as if he had been hit by an infinite number of sharp blades. Izuku, now without both arms, and half skull, fell to the ground on his back with a loud thud while all might, and the students watched the scene with shocked eyes. Air cutter plus air propulsion plus 5 air boost quirks plus controlled output. Said all for one lowering his hand a nice combination which allows me to unleash thousands of powerful blades of wind in a demarcated area in front of me. Sensei, did you defeat him? Asked Tamura, looking at his teacher in awe. After a couple of seconds, all for one uttered a single word no. What ash? His arms are growing back. Noted Kurojiri looking at the form of Izuku with narrowed eyes. Not only can he use fire, but he also has super regeneration, growled Tamura. He's cheating. Now one could say that I am cheating too, said all for one however it is time to go. Kurojiri if you could. With a nod, the villain opened another portal, and the Noma entered it, followed by Tamura while the masked villain looked at all might it seems that today won't be our last meeting. However I want to go leaving you with a choice. He raised both arms, pointing them in different directions before they both grew bigger, as if they could not contain his power the son of the number two hero, Endeavor, or the heiress of the Yayorosa company. Who will you save? All Might's eyes widened in disbelief, while his mind realized that all for one's left arm was aimed at the small group of students not far from Izuku, while the other arm was pointing the top of the stairs leading to the central plaza, where there were other students together with Shota. This isn't good. Even with my speed I won't be able to move them all before they get hit. With that one thought in mind, All Might faded into a burst of speed just as All for One released the power contained in his arms. Outside the USJ slash a few seconds earlier, Power Loader's vehicle stopped abruptly, as everyone else was already leaping out, and then rushing toward the entrance to the stadium, with Nizu and Recovery Girl sitting on Vlad King's shoulders. The first to reach the entrance was present Mike who entered screaming, All right, we need Tio Dash. But his voice was overwhelmed by a deafening roar followed by a violent gust of wind that threw the heroes to the ground, as well as the students close to the stairs, causing panic among them. For a few seconds, they all stood on the ground, groaning in pain with a sharp whistle in their ears, then slowly they started to get up. Tenya was the first to turn his gaze on his classmates, noting that Achiko, Yuga, Minoru, Mina, and Mizo were fine, and that now also Shoto, and their teacher had joined them, although Shoto was seriously hurt from what he could see but not worse than 13, whose body was held tightly in Nizo's arms. Of what happened? Asked Midnight holding her head with one hand. Nizo stood up staggering before looking at the students everyone, are you alright? Achiko was the first to want to answer him, to tell him that they were fine, but the words died in her throat, as soon as she remembered what happened to 13. Slowly, her gaze shifted to the hero in the arms of her classmate, and when even the teachers the state in which 13 was reduced, they couldn't hide the shock in their eyes. Recovery girl was the first to run towards them while Shoto, along with Yuga, placed their homeroom teacher on the ground, next to 13. She stiffened, as she saw 13's helmet, or at least what was left of it, completely black. Like All Might, she too put a hand at the base of the neck to feel a possible vibration in their suit, but she didn't feel anything. In her long career she had witnessed the death of many heroes, some of whom were also her dear friends, but each time her heart was about to stop knowing that she wasn't able to do anything. Without saying anything, she shifted her gaze to Shoda, noting how his injuries, though brutal, weren't lethal, at least not if he received medical attention quickly. Vlad come here, and help me to fix his arms, they are broken, said the old heroine with a firm voice while the man knelt at her side. Oh, what about 13? shouted Midnight pointing at her fellow hero, but recovery girl merely shook her head. There is nothing that I can do now, we arrived late. Midnight opened her mouth to reply, 
but stopped when ectoplasm put a hand on her shoulder, shaking his head. Holy. Present Mick's voice caught their attention, and they saw that he was at the top of the stairs, intent on observing the situation below. Slowly, most of the teachers approached him along with the students, and what they saw shocked them even more. The place had been reduced to a wasteland. The pavement had been completely swept away along with all the surrounding trees. On the right, slumped against some destroyed trees, there were Katsuki, Tsuyu, Momo, Denki, Aijiro, and Koji, all of them with various wounds on their body. Not far away, there was Izuku with his body turned into a flaming skeleton intent to regenerate his wounds, but what surprised them most was on the other side of what was once the central plaza. A tall man dressed in a black suit, and a mask of the same color covering his face was standing with his arms outstretched. Behind him, there was a strange black fog that was changing shape, assuming a vaguely humanoid shape, while in front of him was All Might. The pro hero had both fists resting against the palms of the masked man's hands. His shirt was now tattered to show his body covered with wounds, but the worst were his arms, completely covered with cuts and blood. You never cease to amaze me, All Might. Throw yourself in front of me, and use two Texas Smash to counter my attacks without knowing what kind of attack I would have used. Said all for one with an amused voice since you were so driven to counteract my attack. I allowed myself to add impact recall too, so that I could use your strength against you. All Might glared at him before taking a step back, raising his arms like a boxer I haven't lost yet. All for one. Obviously you haven't lost. We will have the chance to end our fight the next time we see each other. Said the masked villain before unleashing a powerful shockwave from his own body, throwing All Might several meters away. Enjoy it, as long as you can, this transient piece of yours. All for one then turned to Kuro Jairi, telling him to open a portal but, before entering the aforementioned portal, he raised a hand to deflect three bullets aimed at his head. Looking at his side, he said save your bullets, snipe. Such a weapon will never stop me. And with that, he entered the portal which closed immediately afterwards, taking with him, also Kuro Jairi. At the top of the stairs, Snipe put his gun away. They managed to escape. Ignore them. We have more urgent problems at the moment, said Nizu, looking at the wasteland in front of him. Go, and look for the other students, and protect them. The police should arrive at moments together with ambulances. Present Mike, Sniper, Ectoplasm, and Midnight nodded before running away while Power Loader and Cementos went to help All Might and the others. Principal Nizu. The little humanoid animal didn't move, still giving a sign to Hound Dog that he was listening to him. We have never been hit so hard. These villains are not like everyone else, and today wasn't a simple message like with the gate. Yes, I know. They have clearly declared war on us, nodded Nizu with his eyes fixed on All Might, and the other students once back at UA. I will summon the school council. I want all the teachers present. We have to act quickly. We don't know when they will come back. And now we know that All for One was the mind behind the first attack. Yes, sir. Nodded Hound Dog with his glare fixed on the spot where the masked villain had crossed the portal. What about the students? First of all, let's make sure they're okay. We'll explain everything to them tomorrow, said Nizu with a calm voice. But the Hound Dog was sure that the principal wasn't looking forward to that kind of explanation. There's also the matter about 13. Nizu sighed, suddenly feeling a great weight on his shoulders. We will discuss it tomorrow. For now I want the body to be transported to a mortuary even at the cost of going against the police. I don't want a hero who sacrificed himself for the students to receive the treatment of an ordinary corpse. Very well, nodded Hound Dog before looking back at the main entrance looks like the police are here. In fact, at that moment, dozens of policemen came along with some nurses who rushed to help Shota and the injured students while the policemen were preparing to arrest the unconscious villains. Unknown location. A portal of dark mist opened inside what looked like a large warehouse, and Tamira came out of it, along with Nomu, then followed by All for One, and finally Kuro Jairi. The young villain turned to his teacher to ask him something, but a female voice was heard in the air. Welcome back, honey. From above a large silo a figure jumped up before landing a few meters from Tamira, revealing to be a young girl with brown hair that covered her left eye. Would you like a bath, a warm meal or maybe me? Keen growled at Tamira looking at her. What are you doing here? Kayahaha. I'm helping Sensei to save your ass, laughed the girl showing her sharp teeth if it hadn't been for my bees, you would have been burned to ashes by flaming centaur. Why you? Calm down, Tamira, said all for one with a calm voice walking toward the door. He opened it thus showing a small office full of monitors and a large chair in the middle. He took off his helmet and collar by placing them on a small piece of furniture before going to sit down, where he then stuck some small cords in his face, even if only his mouth remained on his face since his entire head was covered with scar tissue. He looked at Tamira. The presence of Flaming Centaur is an unexpected factor, and we should have given more credit to the news of those journalists, but now what is done is done. It does not make sense to cry over spilled milk. Tamira, find stronger troops. 
Take all the time you need. It is time for the world to understand the terror you represent. Tamira nodded at his teacher before leaving the office with Keen and Kiro Jairi who wore them at their hideout. The mist man then walked behind the counter of the bar, serving a drink to the girl. So, what are you going to do now, Tamira? Asked Keen with a grin without looking at him. I'll do, as I have been told, and I will find stronger allies. Those students are stronger than expected. They completely wiped out our associates, and even that useless American was defeated by Flaming Centaur, as well as the second Noma, growled Tamira sitting in front of the counter before side looking at her. Do you know someone? Keen looked at the ceiling for a moment before grinning again. Maybe I met him when he was just a masked vigilante, but now he has become something more dangerous. Who is he? Kayahaha, anxious to get to work, aren't we? Laughed Keen before tossing her glass at Tamira, who caught it before pulverizing it with his quirk. He's slowly becoming famous, but I think you can already know him, as the hero killer, Stain, USJ. It took at least 40 minutes, but eventually all the criminals were being transferred to armored police vehicles while the students were close to the entrance, most of them with some bandages or patches in plain sight. A man with a coat and hat typical of the detectives was counting them. Besides the one with the wound in the abdomen, it seems that everyone hasn't suffered serious injuries. What about Aizawa Sensei? Asked Suyu looking at the detective. Both arms were smashed to splinters. His face is also fractured. Thankfully, he doesn't have any brain damage, but his eyes sockets have been pulverized. There's a chance he may suffer long-term loss of vision, or so they told me from the hospital. Explained Neo Mesa looking at her, earning some worried looks from the other students. All Might's injuries aren't life-threatening. It's possible that Recovery Girl's quirk will be enough for him. So he's gone off to the nurse's office with your classmate and I actually have business there myself. He looked at a policeman with a cat head, Sansa. I'll leave the rest to you. Understood. Nodded Sansa raising his arm. Naomesa looked for a moment at Izuku, who was sitting near the entrance, before shifting his gaze toward Niza principal. I had to go, and talk to All Might about some important issues. I would like to know if it is possible to take Izuku Midoriya with me. The little humanoid animal looked at him with surprised eyes. May I know why? It's because of his condition, said Naomesa with a knowing look and that was enough for Nizu who simply nodded at him. Thank you very much. I'll contact you in the future. Then he looked back at Izuka Midoriya. You need to come with me. I have some questions for you. Izuka seemed surprised by the request, but nodded the same, as he followed the detective while the other students watched the scene in confusion. However, when they asked why the detective had taken Izuka with him, Nizu told them that it wasn't important for now, and that soon they would all be back to school. Meanwhile, Izuka had just climbed into Naomesa's car. What about my bike? We will make sure it is transferred to your address, said Naomesa looking at the road. After a few seconds of silence, Izuka asked did you have problems at work because of me? Naomesa sighed before shaking his head with a little smile. Not too many. When the journalist saw you at school, the chief found out your identity using his authority, and it was easy for him to do 2 plus 2, so he called me into his office. I told him some things, omitting many details. At the end he seemed satisfied, but he warned me that with another stunt like that my career will be over. I'm sorry, said Izuku, looking away before adding, he took it better than expected. He is strict, but just, he hasn't forgotten that during your career, as a vigilante you have saved many lives, including those of several policemen, replied Naomesa with a calm voice. In public he must appear, as a firm, and tireless leader, but in private he knows that many laws are not exactly welcome among the population. It's also the reason why he decided not to take you to the police station, and keep you in jail. Sounds like a reliable boss, said Izuku with a little smile. Yeah, Naomesa spared a side glance at him so, care to tell me what happened today? Izuku's side shit happened. You're talking like Johnny, noted the man with an amused smile. After almost a minute of silence, Izuku began to tell us we arrived at the USJ where 13 explained some things to us. Then the villains arrived, and I lost control again. Today it was almost impossible to try to fight against my quirk. There were some villains with such a dark soul that I transformed almost instantly, and tried to kill them. Do you remember any of them? Besides the simple villains, there was a guy made of black mist. His name was Kurojiri or something like that. It was he who brought the villains into the USJ and then dispersed all the students. Then there was the one who commanded them, a skinny guy with several hands attached to the body. He's the one who had the darkest soul of all and looked like the leader of that group because he was the one who gave orders to the Nomis, explained Izuku looking at the city. The Nomis? Two humanoid creatures, larger and more muscular than All Might and with the brain visible to everyone, said Izuku with a nod. I fought one of them, and killed it, but from what I remember I didn't feel anything, as if I were fighting an empty shell. I don't like it from what we know about your quirk. You should be able to perceive something similar to the sins committed by those around you, but even an innocent person should give some results, said Naomesa stopping in front of a red light. Anyone else? There was a man who fought against me, with a sand-based quirk. He was very strong, 
but above all he was innocent. Naomesa looked at him with confused eyes. What do you mean? He's innocent. I fought him while I wasn't in control, but I didn't kill him, explained Izuka with his eyes closed. Trying to remember their fight before I left I told him he was innocent. I see I trust your judgment, but I think the police won't listen to me, especially after what happened with 13. Any judges will propose an exemplary punishment for all those we have arrested today, sighed Naomesa driving toward Izuka's school. I know it just seems strange to me that an innocent person decided to help those villains. If I remember correctly he said he was doing it for his daughter, but I could be wrong, sighed Izuku. And in a few minutes Naomesa stopped the car in front of the main school gate. The two of them walked for a couple of minutes until they reached Recovery Girl's office, and the detective opened the door apologizing for the intrusion. Lying on a bed with several bandages on his arms, there was all might in his weak form, intent on staring at the ceiling. At his side, Recovery Girl was writing something on a piece of paper before turning to them. Oh, welcome. I guess you're here to talk to All Might, said the old heroine with a little smile. While Naomesa nodded, Izuka looked around before asking where is Koda? Shouldn't he be here? He is resting in the next room. He needs to sleep and it's better to leave him in silence with two little animals that I let in. Apparently they calm him, explained Recovery Girl. So, how are you doing, All Might? Asked Naomesa with a smile walking toward the hero who looked at him with a grin. Could be better, said All Might before shifting his gaze to Zuku. How are you feeling, young Midoriya? I'm fine, thanks, nodded the young boy sitting on a chair before asking. I know that maybe it doesn't concern me, but do you know who those villains were? Especially the one with the mask. All Might sighed before sitting up against the back of the bed with a little effort. That man was all for one you could say that he is, and was the nemesis of all those who inherited one for all. Izuka looked with worried eyes at Recovery Girl and Naomesa, but the old heroine smiled. Don't worry, we all know about one for all. Outside this room there are few other people who know the whole story, and in this school only Nizu is aware of it. I see. All Might coughed to get his attention back. As I was saying he is my nemesis. Years ago he fought against my teacher, and killed her while I was forced to flee to avoid dying with her. Do you remember when we met for the first time, and I showed you my wound? When he saw Izuka nod, he continued. I got it in my last fight with All for One, not fighting Toxic Chainsaw. That time I defeated him, but he managed to escape. I thought I had weakened him so much that I stopped all his future plans, but in the end he came back, and apparently he is not alone. You're talking about the League of Villains? Asked Naomesa, having received some data from the short questions asked to the students. Is that what they're called? All Might shook his head anyway, yes. That boy Tamira called him Sensei. And from what I've seen, All for One wanted to help him so I'm inclined to think that Tamira is a form of pupil or student. There are also these Nomis. Izuku told me that he fought against one of them before killing it, but the second one said Naomesa gesturing to Izuku. I fought against the one with the beak, and trust me, it was really strong. It could resist my blows and possess the ability to regenerate at an alarming rate. It must be a creation of All for One, said All Might with a grim face before looking up at Naomesa. What about Aizawa? How is he? Probably in the operating room. His wounds are not lethal, but his head and arms have been severely damaged. Explain the detective if you three heroes hadn't put your lives on the line I don't know how it could have ended. We still lost 13. He went down like a hero while protecting students under his custody, said Recovery Girl with a calm, but sad voice the funeral will probably be tomorrow morning. All Might shook his head, sad for losing a friend and fellow hero. Before looking at Izuku young Midoriya, we need to talk. What? Asked Izuku, raising an eyebrow. Maybe about his own quirk, about one for all. That was unexpected. What? Why? Young Midoriya, as you have surely noticed, I am no longer the hero of the past. With each passing day, the time limit for my heroic form is shortened, said All Might with a serious voice while looking at the young boy today. I didn't push myself over the limit because All for One intervened before I could fight at full power against that Nomu, but I still suffered some damage, especially in the arms, and now I'm not able to fight for at least a couple of days. He sighed again what I'm trying to say is that now that he is back, our last fight could be very close. Although he showed his strength today, I'm sure he's not 100%, just like me. So your next fight will be the last one, whatever happens? Most likely that's why I need to find a successor for one for all. So that in the worst case, someone else will be there after me. The hero looked for a moment outside the window. That's why I would like you to be the temporary holder of one for all. Izuka looked at him with confusion. He was about to say no, since they had already discussed it in the past. But the temporary part was new. What do you mean by temporary holder? All Might raised a finger there are some aspects of my quirk that I have to explain to you. First of all, in order for the baton to pass successfully, both sides must be in favor. To get one for all you have to assimilate my DNA inside of you, but if you were against the idea, nothing would happen even after having assimilated my DNA, 
Same thing for the reverse case. He raised the second finger the second part that I haven't explained to you before is that if you accepted to get one for all, you wouldn't automatically become the ninth holder of this quirk. Izuka continued to look at him in confusion, not understanding how such a thing was possible. Do I have to do something specific to become the ninth holder? Midoriya, he looked at Recovery Girl. You know that one for all is a quirk that allows you to stockpile your power along with the previous owner's power, right? He nodded now look at this. The old woman showed him a transparent vase with some flowers inside, then took a small pocket of water used for transfusion. Gently, she placed the bag of water inside the vase. Now, imagine being the vase while the water bag is one for all. Said Recovery Girl, do you think that the water inside the bag will help the flowers stay hydrated? Izuka shook his head no, because it's inside that little bag. That's the point said All Might pointing at him. To become the ninth holder of One For All, and then stockpile your power to the whole, you'll first have to use One For All at least once. With the first use you will officially become the holder of One For All, while I will remain with some leftovers with which I can continue fighting for a while, depending on how I use them. I see. But what's the point of being a temporary holder? Asked Izuku with a raised eyebrow. Because One For All will actually be inside you, and you will be able to pass it on to someone else when you want. It's a security measure, so to speak. In case something happens to me, explain All Might again with his serious voice when you pass it on to someone. Without ever using one for all, that person will become the ninth holder, as long as they use this quirk. Izuka nodded, having understood All Might's reasoning and wanting to entrust his quirk to him. I guess I can do that. For a moment I thought you wanted me to become the ninth holder. No, in the past you told me that you didn't want to inherit my power, and I can't force you to change your mind. It's not my style, said All Might while shaking his head. The young boy nodded again. But then a doubt made its way into his mind. What about my own quirk? You know that sometimes I lose control of my own body. What would happen if I used one for all while I'm not in control? I don't think you will use it, said All Might with a calm voice from what I've seen and heard. Your quirk is unique and extremely powerful. When you are in control, you still cannot use its full power while when you lose control, we haven't yet met someone who could stop you. Today all for one managed to damage you, but you were already regenerating immediately after being hit. I have the impression that none of us really saw the true power of your quirk. That's why I don't think you'll get to use one for all. Because in the end it's a quirk that makes you stronger physically. In my case I also got my muscular form. But the real quirk is based on the strength I gain. That is only a hypothesis though. Noted Izuku with an arched eyebrow. Up until now I have only dealt with simple villains. But all for one is extremely more dangerous than all of them. I can't even understand what his quirk is. Is it some kind of wind control? All Might shook his head no. His quirk is called all for one, just like him. He can steal the quirks of others, taking them for himself, and leaving other people without their quirk. He can also merge those quirks to create new attacks, as you saw today, and he can also transfer the quirks he steals to other people. He is also the one who made sure that one for all was created. Izuka widened his eyes in surprise. What? One for all was created thanks to him? All might not it apparently, many years ago. All for one had a younger brother who apparently was quirkless. All for one gave him a quirk the power to stockpile power, but his brother already possessed a quirk apparently useless, and that is the possibility of being able to transfer it to others. Those two quirks merged inside All for One's brother, and so the quirk One for All was created. After that moment, that quirk has been handed down from generation to generation, gaining more and more power. It's a bit hard to believe, don't tell me. Chuckled Neo Mesa when he told me the whole story, I was tempted to test him to see if he was drunk. Izuka smiled at his friend before looking back at All Might. Are you really sure about this choice? Aren't there any other candidates to inherit one for all? No, for now there are no other possible candidates. But maybe during the UAS Sports Festival I will find someone suitable, said All Might. And Izuka was so focused on him that he didn't notice the disapproving look that Recovery Girl sent to the pro hero. The young boy looked at his idol for a couple of seconds before sighing all right. If I have to be just a temporary container then I accept. What should I do to get one for all? All Might grinned at him before pulling off a hair. It's simple. Eat this. Are you fucking kidding me? UA main courtyard slash the next day. It was a gloomy day. Clouds full of rain covered the sky and thunder was heard in the distance. The entire school had gathered in the main courtyard, where a large photo of 13 stood on a wooden stage, surrounded by white flowers. In the first row there were all the teachers and staff members, behind them the first year students of all the courses, then those of the second year, and finally those of the third year. All of the students wore school uniforms with a black band around their arms, while the teachers were dressed elegantly, but in dark colors, except for Shota who was still in the hospital. Classes for the day had been cancelled for every course, and the teachers would then move to the place of the actual funeral, away from any journalist. As the first drops of rain began to fall, 
Nisa slowly climbed onto the stage, watching all the people gathered in front of him. As you have probably already heard, yesterday something unexpected and terrible happened. During a lesson at the unforeseen simulation joint, the Class 1A of the Hero Course was attacked by a large group of villains. Their aim was to kill All Might, but that didn't stop them from creating chaos and trying to kill the students. He paused for a moment. The criminals were defeated and forced to retreat, but at a high price. 13. A hero who dedicated his life to saving people and teaching at this school was killed while defending the students. He was not strong, he was not fit to fight, but that didn't stop him and he did everything to protect others. All the heroes should take inspiration from him, because he put the safety of others in front of everything, even in front of his own life. Yesterday, this school lost a unique and irreplaceable teacher. Japan lost one of its best heroes, and I, like all the teachers here present, lost a dear friend. Izuku noticed that some of the teachers, as well as some of the students, were crying in silence. None of them was showing their emotions, but he could very well notice the sadness in their eyes, even in those of All Might, whose arms were still bandaged. This school will go on, each of us will go on, to pay tribute to the memory of Thirteen, one of the best heroes I've ever known. His dream was to teach students to use their quirk to save the defenseless people, and I hope that those who have had him, as a teacher, will take his teachings with them forever. Thank you. A short, but intense applause followed his words, but Izuka heard someone talking not far from him where the classes of general studies were. I heard that those in the 1A were the first to attack, and that's why 13 died. Flaming Centaur is in that class, right? In my opinion, they attacked to take revenge on him. I still don't understand how they could have admitted him here. Izuku slowly clenched his fists without saying anything. As far as he knew, it could also be true, but from his memories, all those villains were terrified of him, and Tamira wanted to kill All Might, but nothing gave the right to those students, who weren't present during that hell, to talk about it. Behind him, Momo noticed his gesture before looking at him with worried eyes. A little while later, when the crowd had dispersed and the students headed home, Izuka was standing in front of his motorcycle wearing a black leather jacket over his uniform. Shaking his head to chase away some thoughts from his mind, he started to put on his helmet when a voice surprised him from behind. Midoriya? Turning around to see who had spoken, he was surprised to see Momo walking towards him with an umbrella, probably created with her quirk. Jayorosa? What are you doing here? I wanted to talk to you. I hope I didn't disturb you, said Momo looking at his helmet, and then his motorbike. No, don't worry. What did you want to talk about? Asked Izuka leaning against the bike after placing the helmet above the saddle. After the principal's speech, I noticed how you were reacting to the words of the other students. Izuka sighed, shifting his gaze to the ground. What do you think about it? They're wrong. Izuka looked at her with surprised eyes. They weren't there with us. They didn't have to fight against bloodthirsty villains, and above all they didn't experience that feeling of absolute terror when that masked man appeared. Momo couldn't suppress a shiver while remembering that moment it is true Bakugo, Kurishima, and Kaminari shouldn't have been acting impulsively, but it's not their fault, and the same goes for you if you hadn't been there. I don't know what would have happened to me, and the others. If I could control my quirk, I wouldn't have flung myself towards them. I could have been there, and saved 13 maybe, replied Izuku. But in the end he's gone, and it makes no sense to think about what could have changed. Momo remained silent for a few seconds. Thank you? Izuka looked at her with confused eyes. Why are you thanking me? Because you saved my life, as well as that of Azuri and Koda. Yesterday we were in trouble, and we could no longer defend ourselves. But then you came, and you defeated all those villains. If it weren't for you, Azuri, and I would have suffered a fate worse than death, and for that thank you. Explained Momo with a little smile on her lips. Izuka matched the smile. Well, at least something went right. A sudden thundering caught their attention. They were both close to the school's underground parking's exit, and from there they could see how a real storm broke out. Looking at Momo for a moment, he asked her do you want me to take you home? Momo looked at him with surprised eyes, not expecting that kind of question. It's raining a lot, and you only have an umbrella. If you want you can create a waterproof cape, and I'll take you home, said Izuku gesturing to his motorcycle. I drive well in the rain. Oh no, don't worry. A car is waiting for me, said Momo waving her hand. Izuku arched an eyebrow, but said nothing before shrugging suit yourself. Can I ask you one thing? You just did, chuckled Izuku. What do you need to know? Yesterday you created chains from flames. I didn't know you possessed such power. Where are you hiding it? Izuku shook his head. This quirk is still a mystery for me. When I'm not in control my quirk can do absurd things. When I manage to regain control, I remember slowly what happened, and apparently I can even become a giant. Momo looked at his shocked eyes. A giant? Yeah, I can change my size, like Empty Lady, nodded Izuku. But I don't know how it is possible. I'll probably try to understand it in the future, as I will try to create other chains. Since it looks like a power similar to your quirk, would you like to give me advice? Yes, I don't see any problem with that, nodded Momo with a smile before showing a more troubled face. Will you lose control again? 
I don't know for years I kept training to control that aspect of my quirk, but sometimes I just cannot stop it, sighed Azuku, looking away. It's also one of the reasons why I didn't want to enter this school. I'm too dangerous. Do you know why you lose control? Asked Momo, shivering a bit due to the cold wind. Izuka seemed to notice and stretching an arm toward her, slowly opened his hand, creating a sphere of fire that began to heat her body slowly. She smiled at the gesture. Thank you. You're welcome, nodded Izuku. About your question, let's say that it's related to the wickedness of people. If someone extremely evil is near me, I might lose control. Momo seemed to think of something so the other day. Someone had appeared near the school. Izuka pointed with his free hand toward the exit. When they destroyed the gate, I felt their presence, and my quirk took control. Now only extremely evil people can make me lose control, but I think over time I will be able to control my quirk. I think you will succeed. When you became famous for the first time, you left only victims behind. Now you are trying to improve, said Momo with a little smile before walking away. Thank you for your time, Midoriya. See you tomorrow in class. Izuka waved at her with one hand before getting into the saddle and putting on his helmet. With a roar, the engine of his motorcycle came to life and Izuka darted in the rain toward his home. Yue class 1A slash the next day. It seems that the general mood isn't the best. Thought Izuka was looking around. Almost everyone seemed without energy, as if they did not want to do anything. Evidently the accident at the USJ had shaken them more than expected. At that moment the classroom door opened slowly, and Shoda entered the morning. You're back already, Aizawa sensei? Asked Mina looking at him with shocked eyes. Glad to see you doing well, sensei, said Tenya raising his hand, losing for a moment his grim face. If you can call that doing well murmured Ochako behind him. My welfare isn't important, said Shota sitting behind his desk before looking at the class. So, who wants to quit? The students in front of him looked at each other in confusion. Why should we quit, sensei? Asked Hanta. Because right now, I see people who have lost any desire to become heroes, replied Shota, confusing them even more. You are all probably shaken by what happened the other day, and you are right to be so. However cruel, as it may be, that's the real world. Out there, Heroes risk their lives every day, so if you think you can make fun of them by staying here just because you're students, it would be best if you left this school. Those words seemed to ignite a spark inside their eyes, but none of them spoke. Good. It seems that you are not ready to give up. Not yet at least. Aizawa looked at each one of them. We'll see it soon, because your battle is not over yet. Our battle? You mean, more villains? Shouted Minoru with a desperate voice. The UAS Sports Festival is fast approaching, said Shota, catching them off guard and that's why the next two weeks will become a real hell for you. Why is that? Asked Mina, and she wasn't quite sure she wanted to know the answer. Because by the principal's order, your classes on using your quirk will become more challenging. Normally this point would be reached later in the school year, but after what happened the other day it's better to anticipate. Explained Shota before adding it's time to strengthen your quirks. Thanks for watching my video, and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic. Link is in the description. See you next time, till then sayonara.